Hello and welcome to Covert Castaway. I'm Holly. Je suis Stéphane. Join us as we share what we learn and how we're making the transition to live aboard cruising. We are so excited. We are back in school. Yep. How does it feel to be back in school? Well, it's good because you don't have like a grade. <laughs> Nobody's testing you. No. <laughs> yeah. So we're super excited to talk today about going back to sailing school. Um, you know, we've had a couple seasons on the boat, but we're really, you know, thrilled to be able to take advantage of some of these training classes that Uchimera offers. Um, just as a recap, we're taking you through our current experience in, you know, selecting a new boat, things on the new boat and kind of going through the whole buying process, which we talked about a little bit on the, on the podcast before, but today we are covering really, um, the main focus is on Uchmer Academy, which is the practical sailing, uh, on, on these boats that's being offered. And, uh, it's really part of a broader training program that they provide yeah and that's not even something that we considered when we decided to move from our front end Peugeot to our Outremer so it's kind of a a surprise and and welcome surprise so especially because it's free basically yeah you you pay for it but uh as long as you buy the boat yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you they're kind of like uh, yeah discounting. you pay f- every time you sign up for something but then they discount it from the price of the boat at the back end so yeah, yeah that's how it works so yeah so there are many many programs that Utomer offers there is the uh, uh, something is coming soon called Utomer week they have this twice a year we'll talk about this in a future episode um they it's ha- coming up in just a couple of weeks for us that, yes. That'll be really fun. Yeah. 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 So, and then an opportunity to meet a lot mm-hmm. of new owners. So quite exciting to, to participate in this. Um, there is also a program called Escal Formation Technique. And uh, so it's basically the technical training. So that could be like weather or celestial navigation. or Instruments, electronics, uh, medical, diesel. Medical, yeah. diesel, all these important classes that are being offered as well. Which uh, we all wanted to take you know, before as well, but, you know, in in terms of signing up for everything, scheduling everything, researching every possible course you can take, um, what we found initially the first time is you had to research so many things and sometimes your schedules didn't line up and whatever. And so this company that's called Eskel Formation Technique that works with like Outremer. Did they, they buy them or something? Not sure. I don't know. But yeah. But basically, they package some of those classes in term a week, but they also you can also take those classes. I mean, it's yeah. local, it's in France. But and it's all take- for cruisers. So you're yeah. not taking some, like, you know, we, we were going to have to take some regular mountain survival class to learn mm-hmm. how to do the medical stuff. This is specific to being on the water. Yeah. Uh, so that's also really cool. Yeah, no, so it's, and I've heard really, really good feedback yeah. about the, the quality of the training and the instructors. You like sew up a chicken breast or whatever. That'll be fun. Yeah. <laughs> then they have also um, uh, Outremer Cup, which is like a little racing weekend. Um, and, uh, and also they have the delivery training. So when you get your boat, you spend five days in the morning. They go, you have like technical people that come on board to talk to you about the different systems on your boat. In the morning and the afternoon, you go sailing. So many, many different programs, really well done, very well structured. But today we're talking about what they call Outremer Academy, which is the, the sailing program. So while everybody else is getting out of school and graduating, we're going back to school for the summer uh, yeah. to learn how to sail, which is a little ironic. But Well, learn how to sail, but more importantly, learn how to sail this boat. those, those boats, those performance boats. Mm-hmm. So let me explain what Outremer Academy is. And it's basically you're going to sail on an Outremer boat to learn to be comfortable, you know, while you wait for your new boat. So it happens in La Grande Motte in the south of France, um, just nearby where the Outremer factory is located. Um, it's over a weekend. So you spend a night at anchor. So a Saturday and a Sunday. Um, you have a coach. Uh, from Outremer, uh, who's super knowledgeable uh, about the boat. Um, you have 
other owners um, that are on the boat. Uh, so you have, depending on the boat, but you can have three or four cabins. So based on that, they fill up the boat. It's not a very big group, though. No, no. Yeah. The first time it was uh, two couples and myself. And last weekend, it was just another One couple, other couple. And us, yeah. plus the coach. Um, so it's well organized because they have everything provided. So you show up on the boat with your bag for the weekend and... That's they, it, your toothbrush. Yeah, your <laughs> toothbrush, yeah. You just, uh, they have uh, towels, the bed sheets, they have um, food and drinks. Um, so yeah, everything. So you show up and then you leave at the end of the weekend. And you only focus on basically sailing and learning the boat. Yeah. And it's cool because it's right there in La Grande Mott, right across the street, literally from where the factory is. Yeah. So if you time it with a factory tour, it'll be really good. And then they're also launching new boats every week. So you can see all the Utremers lined up. And it's really cool to kind of see them all in one spot. Yeah. And and, and another thing that is, uh, well, as a woman, you can, you're going to participate in one. So far, we've joined mixed uh, weekends but they also organize women only ladies only yeah ladies. and that's really good and i'll give you my two cents on on that you know i've been on um different training courses and it, i think it's always helpful uh, to try the ladies only environment because there's just different levels of support um, that, that you're given. And also there's no getting out of it. Like you have to, <laughs> everybody's there to take the helm and sometimes in a mixed environment, it can be intimidating. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would definitely encourage trying both and then seeing w- which one you like better. Cause mm. I, I just, I don't think it's a preference thing. I think it's just being in a different environment and then you can decide, you know, the best learning environment for you. Yeah. And the more important is just to do as many trainings exactly, as you exactly. can. You're going to learn from different experiences. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so far, uh, so the first weekend, uh, you couldn't make it. So it was an Outremer 4X. Uh, last weekend, it was an Outremer 45. So both, uh, they were 48-foot boats. One is more, um, it's kind of uh, built to be really, really light, carbon mast. They had a rotating carbon mast. Um, so everything is kind of all the options on the boat is to save weight. And this past weekend, there was a, kind of a more standard Outremer 45 with an aluminum mast. Yeah. And uh, But also different sail configurations. So the first one had the Gen 1 stay sail and this one had the Solent. So it was good to, you know, to go on different boats and, mm-hmm. and see how they, uh, how they sail. And, uh, and get comfortable on how everything is is on the boat because pretty much, you know, once you've been on an Outremer, you kind of feel a little bit like the the philosophy and you know, mm-hmm. and you felt it was interesting. Like you felt it was easier. Yeah, for you. I mean, um, I felt like in the maneuvers, I was over anticipating how the boat would move. So for instance, one of the things you learn is docking and, you know, we did plenty of docking in the first two seasons for sure, but it's on a heavier boat. And Uchimera also, the coach gave different advice and tips, you know, like we had, we had known, you know, stern to the wind is the way to go in all situations. But, um, for instance, in, in La Grande Mott, the docking situation, like there's a regular docking situation, like at a fuel dock and whatever, which we practiced in tight quarters and turning around and stuff. But um, you have to actually dock the boat um, stern in with the posts. So that was a new situation for me. Uh, have well, you, for had if, you ever done no, that before? No, no, I think it's very specific think- to, it's hard to describe it. Y- yeah, the it's posts are sticking posts. out. Yeah, <laughs> and we can kind of describe this, but, what, yeah. but the point I was trying to make is that I was over anticipating what the boat was going to do because I was used to being on a heavier boat where it would take more time. Like if if I was backing in, um, we would start to get close, and I would need to anticipate the mo- changing of the momentum from reverse to forward. And so I kept doing it too early and, and I had to, like a couple times I had to just kind of go for it 
and then let the boat kind of stop um, because I expected it to drift more backwards before it started going forward. So just a lighter boat just seemed a lot more responsive and, and different. You know, you just have to, it's different timing. Like, you know, as you get to know your boat or a different going from one boat to another, it, it's just important to kind of know how much leeway you have in, in situations like that or how quickly it responds to um, windage on, on the beam, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah, that was really cool. What, so what else did we go through the, the different maneuvers? Yeah, so we done, we've done some anchoring. Mm-hmm. And so the mornings typically have been light. So Lighter, yeah. we, we practice in the, in the marina and docking situations, then uh, just outside marina, we anchor. So there's the anchoring uh, practicing, which we find much easier it's on this so boat. so much easier. Because <laughs> <laughs> the it's just, instead of being in the anchor locker, it's, again, a hard little bit to, to describe, but, you know, it just... Uh, and, the, and the chain and the anchor is kind of... Um, not all the way on, on the end of the bow. It's like on the Fontaine and Peugeot. It's it's. Uh, it's more in the middle of the. Yeah. So you don't hull. see so it. You don't see it. Yeah. You have to kind of move forward. It's like if there's a problem with the chain, you have your head down in the locker, and and here it's just uh, it runs along the um, this compression beam and and the and anchor. You see the is chain just, is exposed at the top. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's. Uh, and then for the communication between the driver and the person um, at the windlass, it's you see each other, mm-hmm. and it's uh, yeah, it seems. Yeah, it was like really a, funny. You know, we we dropped the anchor, and I was like, okay, you know, now do we have to back down on it? Like, do we need to do all the stuff? And the guy's like, no, we're good. And I'm like, wait, that's it? Mm-hmm. I mean, granted, I mean, if there was wind and stuff, you would have yeah, to I mean, do more. But yeah, we stopped for lunch. He's like, no, no, it's fine. You yeah. know, you're anchor. Plus, they know the bottom; it's just sand, so the anchor just you know drops but yeah. when we travel i mean you, you yeah you it just it. seemed less less drama like you know yeah anyway. but they know the area so <laughs> and then and the, and the forecast and stuff like this and so yeah. that's anchoring yeah so so we've done yeah anchoring and uh so it's interesting also obviously uh you know we have a little, quite a bit of experience but they um they make you work like the second day uh, kind of made you work as as couples you know so the first day kind of walking or through the the process so everybody is um, with a different level can can follow but after that because ultimately you're going to get your boat and most likely going to be the two of you right. or more but at least the two of you need to learn how to work together so so then the all we've done part- a lot of that too in, yeah but so, the the st- different putting up the different sails was really good mm-hmm. to kind of do that um, yeah and then the sailing so we um so we've done some upwind sailing so like i said earlier we have to make a decision basically one of the big decisions in the sail configuration is do you go with the with the solent and the code zero or do you go with the genoa and the stay sail and it's kind of like two basic configuration that everybody is like oh what's the right yeah, answer so let me give kind of the simplified version of that so there's sort of a option to do what you would call a comfort configuration um and you can debate whether that's the right terminology or not. Yeah. Um, which is uh, basically includes a self-tacking jib. That's what you're calling the mm-hmm. solent. Mm-hmm. And it's literally you push you push a, the autopilot, it, it tacks for you, and the thing flings over the side, and you literally do nothing. Um, and then if that's the case, then in light wind situations, you have to put up a code zero. Yeah. That you have to rig, so it's so you, know. you have to rig, so this and that. And we're going to do a whole podcast on sail configurations because we're learning a ton. And the second one they're calling the performance um, setup, which basically gives you more sail sail options. But the net of it is your main um, sail is really a Genoa in the front, the head sail, the head sail, yeah. And then for um, going upwind, it's it's a staysail. It's smaller right. sail when you're getting in upwind in, in stronger winds mm-hmm. at some point in time. So. And then there's all the other sails for downwind sails and this and yeah, that, and they're different configurations. But, but it's a good starting that's point the because based of, on what you right. choose here would dictate a lot of this stuff. So. Right. And there's just there there's more advice and perspectives on these two 
uh, different setups. It, again, this is its own podcast because um, that we were talking to a lot of people and we're learning a lot of things. But I would definitely say uh, taking the Uchimer Academy on one or two weekends on different boats with different configurations is really helpful to understand because I went in like, oh, yeah, self-tech and jib. Like, we're all over that. Like, push a button, we're done. Mm-hmm. But then now I can also see the real benefit of having a different configuration. So... Yeah, being on it, and I've seen it on the first weekend on the four X with which where we had the Genoa, and the way uh, the coach like was trimming the sails, which coming from a racing background, like you always hear like the catamarans. If you like, you know, if you if there's too much load, that's the rig, the mast, and everything that that is going to take the load, and it's not good. But those boats are really built for that. So when I will see the uh, Julian in this case, like trimming the sails, this big Genoa, and you know, going upwind, I was like, oh, is that okay for the He's boat? He's just like, cranking it in. Yeah, yeah, you can feel a little bit of mm-hmm. heel, obviously, not to the point of a monohull, but you're like, no, no, this is the boat feels good. And you know, he was describing it in his own terms. And, and then you see behind the water, and you're like, yeah, the boat is tracking flying, along. And yeah. then you take the helm, and the boat is well balanced. So suddenly you're like, oh, okay, you know, I can trim this boat just like a racing boat. Like, I don't have to be like, you know, worried about all these. The boat the is loads, designed for yeah. that. So, so all this that you will maybe learn slowly or as you get more and more comfortable with your boat, suddenly like you're fast forwarding the learning and says, okay, that's the range mm-hmm. that I can that I can do. And then I could realize like, oh, the boat behaves well. It's like a big Genoa in these conditions so the boat can can take it you don't have to like reef or change to a small sail you know you can really push it mm-hmm. with a full main and everything so you can hear input from different people but ultimately you need to figure it out for yourself so those two weekends have been really really helpful to see two head sail configurations and starting to make your own you know um getting your own input mm-hmm. as to based on how you sail the boat, how comfortable you are to Mm -hmm. push those boats and how they are made to be pushed. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then, you know, which sail configuration might be the one that might be right for you. And different trade-offs that you make in that decision. Yes. And as you said, we'll we'll talk about this. But so that's been really helpful. And, And every time, I mean, especially talking to those coaches because they are on those boats all the time so they know them really really well mm-hmm. all the the sailing aspect of the boat and uh, or they've done a lot of like transatlantic race or not races crossings and um and so you can ask questions you know mm-hmm. in, in do you sail we'll talk about more we can transition to downwind sails you know with between the other two big topics is do you go with a symmetrical spinnaker versus an asymmetrical Mm -hmm. you know one is a little bit oh as a couple you know symmetrical drop the main Mm -hmm. just cruise along with in the trade wind with the waves and the wind behind you versus how those boats are meant to sail to be like more off the wind like Mm -hmm. downwind and with asymmetrical spinnaker but just like this is a great example of um you know, the decisions that you have to make mm-hmm. before you get the boat, you yeah. have to make this decision. This is a, this is a, we have a, a B and C decisions. This is an A decision that we're have to, having to make now. So I can't stress enough, um, how important it is to kind of get clear in your head about which configuration to have and getting on the boat and spending not like one day, but you know, a, a couple weekends, I think has really been helpful for us to, I mean, I don't think we've decided yet either what we're doing, but at least we have, we know what our questions are now for people yeah. as we start gathering more and, input. And you're getting more input from different people and, and you're starting to, you, what you don't want is make a decision based on talking just to one person mm-hmm. because you don't know their background. And, and when you listen to one person, it makes sense, mm-hmm. but you know, you need to learn where they're coming from. How mm-hmm. do they sell their boat? You know, how do you want to sell your boat? How comfortable you are? So, you know, I mean, as we we're saying this, you know, even if you cannot come to La Grande Mart, like, you know, there are Outremer boats all Getting over the world. Getting on an Outremer boat, yeah. Finding uh, somebody who was an Outremer, get in touch with them, spend a weekend, go yeah. on a crossing, help them out. The, the, the learning curve will just kind yeah. of, you know, and you'll feel more confident when you go through the decision making for the options. And, you know, I think Otomer knows this. I think they know that, um, 
first of all, people wait a long time to get their boats in general. So they're really into making sure the the owners have something to focus on too, to get them comfortable with the boat. So they just aren't throwing the keys and, you know, wave goodbye, but they've actually, they feel comfortable on the boat because they want their owners to be successful, which is why they set up this whole program. Mm -hmm. Um, But they also know owners learn from owners and that's the best way to do it. So even the way this mix is set up or the Outremere week, you know, it's very focused on owners speaking to owners, um, Mm -hmm. which is also kind of obvious, but. And good because it creates that, you know, community. family, community. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, there's so many positive points. Mm-hmm. The, the number one point being like you, you buy a complex piece of equipment mm-hmm. <laughs> and some people come with very little knowledge and some people come with more knowledge, but it's always good to, mm-hmm. you know, to learn on those particular boats. Mm-hmm. And, and so, and that's way- a good point. I, I just want to reiterate. So, I mean, it was the same, same was true with the FP there were people that had been on boats before and this was their, you know, six, seventh, eighth boat, you know, as, as well as their first boat. And the same is true with Ochamere. Like there's a lot of repeat owners or mm-hmm. owners that have had multiple boats, but there are just as many brand new boat owners um, yeah. there. So, you know, it, it that was surprising to me because I thought it would be more, you know, second, third boats. Um, yeah, but it's I definitely, think, it, I don't know the percentage. I mean, we could, uh, probably, uh, try to interview somebody at Utomer, but I think, uh, what we've heard is there are people who've had Utomer will buy another Utomer. <laughs> There's quite mm-hmm. a few of those. Um, there are people who come from motor yachts and that's, they jump into the performance catamaran right and, away. Yeah. And then, um, they have a steep learning curve. Uh, other boats, other owners like us, you know, buy that, that first boat, think of comfort general, you know, and then realize like we want to do a lot more sailing and, mm-hmm. and then come to, um, to like, you know, the decision to buy a performance. Guitar. And then there was that one couple we met that I guess they lived in Florida and, and they had a new Tremere and they were sailing right around. The, and then oh, no, they, they, they had is a, a different boat. They had a lagoon or something. They had a lagoon or something. And, and then they sailed for a while and they, they were like, okay, we're done. They sold their boat. And then they went back home and they're like, wait, what are we doing? Like, let's go back. Yeah. So and then they're, buy, they're, they're buying a new Tomer yeah. 51. Yeah. So everybody's different, but the other reason also to, um, you know, it's, it's a big lifestyle decision and you're entering in a world that you might not know very well. Mm-hmm. So all these classes are helping you, but also most likely you're going to be doing this or in many cases as a couple. Mm-hmm. And if you want that experience to be successful, <laughs> you want to make sure there is this um, kind of shared knowledge coordination mm-hmm. you want as a couple like to, to go through these. This is a really good point. I mean, we brought this up in past podcasts before, but definitely I think just being on a boat together as many times as possible in a training type of environment where you're also expected to do things together. You know, it's not just, Oh, let's do a sea trial or it's not really a sea trial. It's like a demo trial you know, at a boat show where you just take the boat out here, take the wheel for a few minutes. Like, no, you're actually doing the maneuvers, the docking, you're doing the sail changes, you're doing these things. I can definitely see how it would cause conversations Mm. that, you know, maybe one of the people in the couple wasn't ready for, um, or, you know, uh, hadn't worked out like how to communicate or, or opens conversations that you're going to need to have anyway. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's really, really good to, to do that. And if in the end, after two, three weekends, you decide not to buy a boat, paying for the classes is still way cheaper than buying a boat that you end up having to, you know, change your life and then decide to to make a different decision for yourself later. Mm -hmm. So Definitely, I mean, worth the investment. That yeah, way too. I mean, you're not buying a boat for a season. Yeah, yeah. you're buying a boat for at least a few seasons, yeah. and, and you want this to be as enjoyable as possible. And, and so, have everybody have the right expectations. Yeah. you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, what else did we do? We did the. Um, we did the. Um, yeah. Oh, the other thing that was interesting to me is um, on our front end Peugeot. So we had the uh, helm station with everything brought to the helm. And, and on the Ultramare, at least the 45 oh, yeah. that we sailed on, there is like different kind of winches in different configurations because you have a, a yeah, I mean, anyway, can you talk about what was your first impression? Yeah, so I was sort of, I got to say, I was really 
emotionally attached to the helm setup we had because it's all enclosed, um, like a, like a telephone booth, like you're, you're all secured in, you just say, you know, safely, there's no way you can fall out of the boat, you know, like it's, it's all kind of contained into the co- the cockpit, uh, the helm cover. And then all the lines go to one place and there's winches, like you never have to leave the helm station because we had a sport top mm. and except just uh, yeah. One when if you had downwind sails, yeah, yeah, yeah. then you had to go uh, yeah. on, the, on our case in the port side. So I was concerned that having the winches in different places, I would be disoriented with like where are the lines. And then you also have the dagger boards, which was an entirely new thing, right, for mm-hmm. us. And so what I felt like uh, as we were on the boat is it became very clear what the different lines and what the different winches did. Like their functions were really clear to me. And when I was on the helm on our boat where all the lines lead to, lead to the helm, I got to be honest, like I I would sort of have to stop and think like, okay, this line goes to the, because you're not picturing where it goes. Yeah. It, it's you have like the, the mechanical part of it is gone. You have the labels and that's it. But the yeah, I can see what you mean. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, um, if you're on the, on the, particular winch on the in the cockpit on the port side you can picture okay there's a dagger board over there mm-hmm. that's going to be the downwind like sheet for the spinnaker you, you know you, you can, everything just traveler, seemed much more intuitive if you go on the right. other side yeah it's compartmentalized mm-hmm. a little bit so like you, you don't have to be like okay what line is it it's already it's in that winch only so many lines are coming right like okay. like mechanically i felt more connected to the boat if mm. that makes any sense you know yeah. just and so i was surprised by that because it just was much more intuitive i understood how things worked better and i didn't have to kind of stop and think okay this line goes to where and you mm. know all that so i thought that was pretty interesting but yeah what what we have to learn and get used to is add a step now in our maneuvers because <laughs> we forgot the dagger boards a couple times. <laughs> it's like, okay, Mark says, okay, you do a maneuver and you're like, okay, so it's good. We talk to each other and, and then we do the maneuver. It's like, Oh, we forgot the dagger boards. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's like before every maneuver, it's like, do you have to do anything with the dagger board? Yes. No. Like what yeah. do you need to do? So I'm sure it's going to be second nature, but mm-hmm. it's, it's one more thing we're not used to think about. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, it's not like you have like many, many configuration. It's just, uh, you know, something, uh, you have to just keep in mind and, um, you know, before you, you're doing your maneuver. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dagger boards are a thing. And we're going to do a podcast all about that too. So, um, yeah, so it was a great, it was a great, uh, couple weekends and, um, yeah, the, the, the docking into the pier, um, I don't know, the pier poles, I don't know what they are, what they're called, but so what it is, is you go stern in obviously, but you have two of these piers, out posts, of the water, posts, 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 sorry, out of the water. And they, the, you I have to squeeze your butt inside. Yeah, the idea though, <laughs> and it's tight, but the idea is you actually do push against the post to control well, the boat to back in. And if the wind were coming like perfectly, like perfectly aligned with the, uh, with where you have to squeeze it. It's one thing, but obviously it comes as an angle. Mm-hmm. And so now you have to learn the technique. Mm-hmm. It's like five lines and then <laughs> all Yeah, the so basically long story short is, is as one person is basically doing a little pivot maneuver mm-hmm. on the post. Um, Which is totally like you have a brand new boat. You have a brand new boat and you're like, really, you want me to touch the post? He's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you just lean right up against it and you pivot off it. It's just really <laughs> weird to think about. Um, the other person is on the um, on on the starboard si- side in the front and trying to kind of do a lasso to maneuver. To a lasso, yeah. <laughs> two, um, <laughs> two, two, two lines. Yeah, to, to attach to the post. And Not quite lasso, but you have to bring yeah. the boat close enough so you can just right. it seems like a, a lasso around these. And, it's and then as you're backing in, the danger part of it is um, at some point you lose the post. Um, that you're kind of resting on because the boat backs in so far. And if you're not tied enough on the, the opposite, the opposite side, side so of, the other for the there, wind, yeah. yeah, you can literally just slam into the boat next to you. Well, there's a line, but it, you're trying to avoid it in between like you and the boat, but I don't think it could stop a boat. It, it didn't, 
it, it yeah. didn't. Uh, so, it, but it's it has a lot of steps. Yeah. And with two people, you can do it. And now I think we realize like it's it's just like anything on maneuvers. It's just like Takes one practice. step at a time. And then uh, yeah, but the conditions are always going to be different. The wind's going to be different. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the fenders on the other boats are going to be in different places. That you know, what you're backing to is going to be different. So Not hopefully, we don't have to do that a lot because that was the only place I've seen that in the med, but. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I well the problem is we'll be in like on mud with our boat for a little while. So yeah, that's the bummer. <laughs> I guess you don't get a sign <laughs> a regular <laughs> docking st- place you where you can just sli- rest against the dock. It's going to we're going to have to do that and and um yeah, so unfortunately we're going to have to learn yeah. right out of the gate. So yeah. yeah, so we did we did that quite a bit and um and then it was funny because uh, we were trying to come out. We were going in and out, but then we had to come out because the the real boat who had the real spot needed its spot. Mm. And so I was at the back of the boat and Mark was like, okay, because he was at the helm, the instructor. And he's like, okay, you know, when I say release the line, like release the, the line and really release it. And I was like, okay, I got it. I, I'm good. I, I get what you're saying. So he's like, okay, release the line. And I release the line and he just, he just floors it. And we go out of there. I don't know how fast we were going, but I guess his theory was the faster, the better, because you can control the boat when you're going quickly. Yeah, out. I mean, you had a side wind, so it's yeah. going to push if, if you're going fast and the dagger boards, the rudders are like tracking right. in the water and the boat does not, has enough time wild. to drift. I'd never done that before that fast. You and I both looked at each other I, and our eyes were like this big. We were surprised, but he said, yeah, that's, <laughs> that was just the way yeah. to do it. And then, and, and so, and that totally worked out twice. So, yeah. So. so, yeah. So, yeah, I think what we really enjoyed about um, this weekend is, I mean, the two coaches uh, we had were like super knowledgeable and um, and they both spoke English. I mean, they're French, but mm-hmm. they spoke English, which was good. Yeah, always. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, super calm, explaining the maneuvers. Really, uh, you know, so knew uh, the boats. Yeah, yeah. N- yeah. So that was uh, that was great. I mean, and like I said earlier, you're basically basically fast forwarding your learning from everything they learn. You mm-hmm. know, you can ask so many questions because you spent. We, you know, we stop for lunch, you can talk about sailing, you at dinner at night, you talk about sailing, you know, your next mm-hmm. morning, you talk more about asking them questions, picking their brain. Yeah, so there's sure. a lot you can learn and practice. Um, and then, like I said, all this is going to help us, you know, decision making about the, the, the proper sale plan for us. Uh, it was great the working as a couple mm-hmm. I and mean, we're used to it but plus it was like well we're back on the water and it was sort of yeah. cool because we hadn't been on the water except for you know in Guadalupe on the Hobie cat yeah. um so this is really fun being I mean just it's kind of like we're pretend cruising a little bit yeah well you have like no stress because you're not responsible <laughs> versus when you are your own captain you're yeah. like oh so yeah just spending time and getting comfortable uh, being on Uttermere boats and, and that's going to translate, you know, right. all these to make our transition to our own boat, you know, easier. So, yeah. and, um, and then and the social part of it, you know, uh, yeah, meeting, meeting new people, people. it's yeah. great. And those people are basically people who are getting, going to get boats in the next you right. know, year or less. So those people will probably see them around again. Mm-hmm. And so that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, so uh, just a quick update. We're we're you know still in Montpellier. We're um, I'm going to French school, learning French, mm-hmm. and uh, we bought a car. We bought a car <laughs> temporarily. We won't have it too long, but it is good to get around and take some trips. We've been sort of contained. Um, the city's really coming alive for the summer, and. Um, yeah, so we're having we're still having a really good time here, and um, we have a lot of content uh, as well. There's a lot of things we want to cover, a lot of things we've learned. Like I said, it's a it's a brand new model. If if you've seen anything on our social feeds, we they got the new molds, they poured the new molds for the uh, hole number one, mm. and um, you know we're super excited yeah, about that process. We've been talking about option selection mm-hmm. uh, with Elwa, so. 
we'll talk about this. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's some options are more specific to these new models we won't be able to cover, but at least the philosophy of mm-hmm. you know how we want to equip our own boat um, that applies to everything. So we'll we'll kind of uh, cover that mm-hmm. aspect as well. Mm-hmm. Cool. So uh, that's it for now. If you have any questions or have topics, uh, as always, you can send them to us on our email, which is sailingallen at gmail.com um, or any comments. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. Fair winds for now. Boom, boom. Thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, please subscribe, like, or share with another covert castaway. Fair winds for now. Fair winds for now.